So in Warhammer 40k, it's very fashionable to take your slain heroes and wire them semi-permanently into an enclosed metal box, bolt on some claws and big guns, and throw them back out into the fight. Out of all these hellish body horror creations though, which dreadnoughts are the best and worst in-game? Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where even in death I do serve, and today we're talking dreadnoughts great and small. In this video I thought it would be fun to go through literally every dreadnought with current rules active in the game, talk a little bit about what it does, and give it a rough ranking for an estimation of in-game power right now. Dreadnoughts are rather iconic to the Warhammer 40k setting, there's very little more Warhammer 40k than a massively armoured and stompy looking box of a vehicle, marching up the board or guns blazing before getting to work on you in close combat with a power fist or a big claw. Many of the armies of Warhammer 40k just aren't really too convinced about vehicles that you can get in and out of though, they prefer to wire in their injured or fallen heroes, often into a metal sarcophagus, maintained by the tech marines and the apothecaries of the chapter, meaning that while their space marine body might be broken and damaged beyond repair, they can still bring their fighting spirit and wisdom of the ancients to future generations of space marines, and provide a potent asset of war once they're engaged in battle. There are really quite a lot of them for a whole number of different factions in Warhammer 40k at this point, and for the purpose of this video I'm going to include anything that basically has no pilot, mount or driver at all, and is solely directed by the entombed individual within, and going back to the classic days where the Eldar and Orc versions were also called Eldar or Orc Dreadnoughts, will include the Wraith Lords and Orc Death Dreads as well, but not things that could have pilots like Wraith Knights, or more things like Demon Engines piloted by a spirit rather than a person. That still definitely gives us a lot of things to talk through though. Let's go through each example of these in Warhammer 40k, a little bit about what they do, and then just a rough and very arbitrary power rating out of 10 for how I'd rank them in game, though obviously that can vary a little bit list to list and playstyle to playstyle. I would say that even most of the ones that are ranked lower are very usable, maybe in more casual games compared with cutting edge competitive ones. Putting entire armies of stompy walkers on the table can definitely be a goal in its own right. Jumping in, let's start with the core space marine ones, and we'll start with the classic dreadnought. A bit of an endangered species now, and only represented by this venerable dreadnought model you can see here. I feel like his days are probably numbered when the next space marine codex come out, but hopefully looks like he's safe for 10th edition at least. We'll be kind of sad to lose the classic Castaferum type dreadnought, though I guess the re-sculpted Redemptor is basically the progression of this. In game, he's 135 points in game. It's toughness 9 with 8 wounds and a 2 plus save. The 2 plus armor save does seem to be something that Games Workshop have been unifying them under this edition. He basically gets one of the standard space marine heavy weapons in his right arm and a punchy close combat weapon in the left, hitting at 5 attacks, strength 12, AP 2 and damage 3. A single heavy weapon's maybe not the most exciting, a twin last cannon I guess is fairly punchy and can take a stab at some vehicles and you can field him in a more shooty configuration with last cannon and missile launcher if you just want more of a gun turret dreadnought, though that really does compete very poorly against things like the ballistas that would only be 5 points more. I'd say that perhaps leaves this guy with the close combat weapon which is actually kind of punchy for its weight class plus 1 heavy weapon, though his melee is a bit easier avoided than some given that he only moves 6 inches per turn. Perhaps the biggest thing selling him is his Wisdom of the Ancient special rule, giving you B-roll hit rolls of 1 within an aura of 6 inches, applying to Adeptus Astartes infantry, so in theory he could buff some other things if he's moving up supporting some other space marines going up the board. In the right army that could actually be genuinely useful if you've got lots of on-foot infantry damage dealers that he's likely to cluster around. Sort of feels like kind of like having a space marine captain back in 9th edition. Probably only really getting to be worth it though if you can fetch really quite a lot of units, and a lot of space marine armies tend to rely on more big heavy vehicles for their primary damage dealers these days. And overall I'd say there's just not really all that much room for this guy in a lot of competitive lists, he tends to be very solidly outcompeted by the Redemptor variants right now, for that reason I've chosen to give him a 4 out of 10. Moving on we've got the Mighty Redemptor, the bigger bad and primary style dreadnought from 8th edition, designed to basically be the reimagination of the standard dreadnought and armed with either a macro plasma cannon or a big onslaught gatling cannon. The bigger and more powerful chassis of these guys apparently does come with a great price though, as if being interred in a dreadnought weren't bad enough already. Supposedly these are particularly efficient at burning out and draining their host who pilots them, and space marine pilots giving the ultimate sacrifice of continuing to serve their chapter even in death might find themselves serving for less than normal if they're piloting a redemptor. In game the Redemptor Dreadnought is 200 points for a perhaps very very tough Dreadnought, 
This one's got better toughness and more wounds at toughness 10 and 12 wounds, but perhaps most of all it kept the duty eternal rule, where you get minus 1 damage to attacks that target it. Very nice against anti-tank weapons, though particularly great against things that are damage 2 or damage 3. Between its main gun plus the either extra Gatling cannon or flamethrower, storm bolters or frag storms, and an Icarus pod, it is fairly shooty as well. Quite a lot of small arms to be able to handle infantry. I think in general I'd be tempted by the macro plasma for the massive D6 plus 1, strength 9, AP4 and damage 3 shots. A bit more threatening to heavier stuff like vehicles, though particularly great at killing things like 3 wound infantry or heavily armoured space marines. It might reach melee a little bit more reliably with movement 8 as well, though it does just have the exact same profile as the standard dreadnought for a much higher points cost, so it's definitely a little bit more of a mixed or ranged beast. I'd currently argue that these things are kind of hard to go too far wrong with in just about any Space Marine list. Good damage and good defence, particularly with access to Armour of Contempt, they can be very tanky stomping up the board. Maybe nice to have in Iron Storm Spearhead. Overall, I've chosen to rate them a 9 out of 10. They definitely frequently crop up in competitive lists. Next up, we have the melee pattern of the Redemptor in the Brutalis Dreadnought. This one kind of feels like it was taking notes from the Blood Angels Furioso with a pair of fists or talons but still has some fairly savage close-range shooting with paired multi-melters on the chest. In 10th edition, the option between the fists and talons gives you a couple of other things. They both have the same sort of profile against heavy hitters, though the talons give you a sweep profile in melee that's really quite savage, and the fists instead trade that out for a flurry of bolt rifle shots. I'd perhaps be a bit more tempted by the talons overall, maybe a little bit more reliability in making a mess of hordes if you get up close. The Brutalis is only 175 points, so it's not quite as expensive as the Redemptor, though I'd say arguably is probably not really any more durable per cost, given that the Redemptor gets the minus 1 damage and this guy does not. Its special rule is pretty devastating as well. Brutalis charge gives you a good amount of mortal wounds when you make a charge move, usually either D3 or 3, though you've got a chance of getting D3 plus 3 on a roll of a 6. Overall, I think this guy does a pretty good job of being a dedicated melee dreadnought between those mortal wounds, and still has some shooting. I'd rate it a 7 out of 10 overall. They definitely do see some competitive play. Could be a bit more fun in things like maybe Gladius or Firestorm, where you don't have to worry too much about advancing and shooting. And perhaps Gladius in particular for threatening an advance and charge on something important. Finally, for the Redemptor chassis, there's the Ballista's Dreadnought, the new entry in Leviathan for 10th edition. 140 points for a boxy dreadnought big style, with a fairly classic loadout of the shooty Castaferum dreadnought, with twin las cannons in one arm and the missile launcher in another. For that 140 points, it is significantly cheaper for the same defensive profile, really quite tanky for the cost, and has good damage output with those ballistas las cannons plus two shots from the big missile launcher it gets, which it can swap into frag mode for some anti infantry if that's better. Its special rule allows you to reroll hit rolls against targets that are above half health, which will be most of the time. Its firepower tends to stack up fairly well against competitors, though struggling a little bit against things that are toughness 11 or 12 that the missile launcher won't be as good against. Again, this one's very competitive and stands out quite a lot in Iron Storm Spearhead, where you can get some big rerolls for it. Again, I'd rate this guy a solid 9 out of 10. Moving on to some chapter specific dreadnoughts next, though, let's start with the Space Wolves. Bjorn the Fellhanded was the last surviving member of Lehman Ross's Wolf Guard, left behind to safeguard the chapter for millennia, and still guides the wolves today with his wisdom. He's 180 points for a standard sort of dreadnought type profile, with the 8 wounds and the toughness 9. He does move a bit faster though at movement 8, and is massively tougher to take out by the points cost as well, as he halves any damage that he takes, which is great against anti-tank weapons, and then gets a 5 plus feel no pain even beyond that, making really quite a lot of damage just go away when it tries to hit him. For his damage output, he gets a standard heavy weapon that he could swap for a Hellfrost cannon, interesting with either a damage 2 flamer or a strength 9 damage 5 shot, and whichever weapon that he chooses hits on a 2 plus, and then in melee he does solidly more damage than most dreadnoughts out there, 6 attacks hitting on a 2 plus at strength 12 and damage 3, and also with lethal hits as well. True Claw hits hard. Otherwise, he also comes with one of those rules that ruins an enemy stratagem, so increase a battle tactic stratagem by 1 CP after the opponent's used it once, can be quite disruptive, and he could hit the command point reroll with that. And just overall, as a big stompy and fighty character, he can be really quite nice in the Space Wolves' unique detachment, as he's maybe one of the better choices to fulfil sagas early in the game, perhaps likely to take damage but still survive, or be able to gun down a monster or vehicle from across the battlefield. 
Overall, a really solid dreadnought for the cost, and certainly, showing his experience, I'd rate Bjorn overall a 9 out of 10. Otherwise, the same kit for the Space Wolves can build a whole number of different other dreadnoughts. You can field it as the Space Wolves Venerable Dreadnought for 155 points, and this one gets fun options like the Great Axe and Shield, giving it a 4 plus invulnerable save, plus a axe with a sweep and strike mode, and the strike mode gets damage d6 plus 1, and again gets the option of the Hellfrost Cannon. He basically feels like an equivalent of the standard Dreadnought from the Codex, but with a better buffing special rule, allowing you to re-roll hit rolls and wound rolls of 1 for Astartes infantry within 6 inches. That's actually getting to be really quite a considerable boost for the cost, usually an extra 33% damage output for nearby infantry shooting or fighting. I feel like his rules are maybe a little bit mixed though. If he's taking the fun Blizzard Shield and the Great Axe, then he probably wants to be moving himself forward and taking damage. The supporting rule might have him wanting to be a little bit more conservative and buff other units nearby. Perhaps that would be a little bit more interesting if Space Marine infantry damage dealers were all the rage right now, or if the rule could affect vehicles. Overall, I've chosen to rate him a 5 out of 10. I feel like he's got some interesting stuff going for him, but 155 points is quite a lot to pay, and his raw damage and defence maybe isn't enormously exciting, even if the invulnerable save does help a bit. Moving a bit slower than Bjorn isn't the most helpful either, I guess. Murderfang is the interesting case of the Feral Wolf and Dreadnought that the Space Wolves found just going rogue on the world of Omnicide, making itself known to the Space Wolves as it butchered its way through an entire horde of Chaos Space Marines, and Logan Grimnar decided to capture their erstwhile battle brother and freeze him in stasis to allow him to be unchained and inflicted upon enemies, where the Space Wolves just need something to cause utter carnage in the enemy ranks. In game, Murderfang has that similar sort of profile to the rest of the standard Space Marine Dreadnoughts. Moves a little bit faster at 8 inches, and the main event is the Murder Claws that it gets, a massive 8 attacks at strength 14, AP 2 and damage 3, all with twin links, so pretty good at brutalising both elite infantry and heavy tanks and vehicles there. It gets a 6 plus feel no pain for a little bit more durability, and then has a potentially very scary Murder Maker special rule, when if it gets attacked by an enemy unit, it then gets to launch into its own attack sequence and either shoot or fight itself, which could hopefully barbecue a few enemy infantry if it's counter-firing with heavy flamers, or potentially be some very bad news if it gets to fight at an unusual time with those murder claws. Definitely a model the opponent needs to be careful about how it kills. Mobbing this thing in combat with a whole bunch of different units could be a really bad idea. Overall, at least it's fairly fast, has genuinely very dangerous damage output in melee, and a disruptive special rule. I feel like he's kind of hard to rate too high though, as he's just not really all that tough for the cost, even with the feel-no-pain. Could be interesting and pretty savage as a counter-charge threat though, maybe something that you manage to try and hide a little bit if possible, and then pounce on some enemy elites trying to take a midfield objective. Overall, I've chosen to rank Murderfang a 7 out of 10. Only having objective control 0 is a bit of a weakness as well, it means that he's only really good for damage output and a few secondaries and things, and can't take primary points. Finally, for the Dreadnoughts of Ross, we've got the generic version of the Wolf and Dreadnought, 130 points. They're basically a similar kind of stat line with the movement 8, objective control 0, and the feel no pain. I think it makes sense to give him the Fenrisian axe and the 4 plus invulnerable shield that he gets. And then rather than the fights again rule, he gets actually a really quite scary impact mortal hit special rule, where he's actually got really quite a high chance of getting d3 plus 3 mortal wound impact hits when he charges in, potentially wiping out a bunch of enemies before he even gets to swing. Overall, that gives you a dreadnought that's actually genuinely really quite tanky and really quite dangerous for the cost. Mortal Wound Impact Hits plus Great Axe are pretty big. Seems like a model that can draw the enemy fire and they might have to deal with, otherwise he's going to make a mess. This is just a shame about the Objective Control Zero though. It means that say if you charge and kill an enemy unit on an objective, then it's not going to take it or contest it against anything else. And that is quite a big drawback. Overall I've chosen to rank him a 6.5 out of 10. Genuinely really interesting stat. The Objective Control Zero is a bit of a tough sell though. Moving on to the Dreadnoughts of Sanguinius. And for the Blood Angels, we've got really quite a similar offering in the Death Company Dreadnought, a battle brother that was interred in a Dreadnought and then subsequently fell to the Black Rage, taking the Black to seek an honourable death in close combat before his madness overwhelms him and he becomes a danger to his battle brothers. Again, he's one of the faster ones, moving 8 inches, though gets objective control 0 unless there's a chaplain nearby, and he swings with twin linked blood talons or furioso fists, Either 7 attacks at strength 8 and damage 3, or 5 attacks at strength 12 and damage 3. Both of those perhaps fairly well balanced, 
and he will be getting a lot of hits with those given that he re-rolls the hit roll due to his black rage innately. He also has a feel no pain type save, and also gets the special rule similar to what Murderfan gets, the ability to shoot or fight again, so stacking up really quite a lot more damage if the opponent goes for him in the wrong way. Overall, between those scary twin links profiles and re-rolling all hit rolls, I definitely think that he has the damage outputs to make it. It's maybe kind of similar to Murderfang, really. Very scary if he gets there, but not really quite as tough as most for the cost while he is moving up the board. And having the chance for his objective control to go to zero maybe isn't the most helpful either. Overall, I've chosen to rank him a 6 out of 10. Otherwise, for the version of the same Dreadnought that hasn't fallen to the Black Rage, or at least not yet, is the standard Furioso. This is just basically the Blood Angels version of the standard Castiferum Dreadnought that most other Space Marine chapters field. But like the Brutalis that we already talked about, it swaps out its big gun for a second close combat weapon, sporting a pair of Furioso Fists or Blood Talons to butcher enemy infantry. It also does have the option of swapping out one of those for a Heavy Frag Cannon as well, potentially going for just one Furioso Fist and D6 shots at Strength 7, AP 1 and Damage 2, with an extra D6 at Extreme Close Range. Despite that though, I think I'd be more tempted to go with one of the twin-linked options. The frag cannon's alright, but you might still be passing up an okay gun with a melter gun or heavy flamer. I feel like the damage output is okay, but not super exciting perhaps. The Furioso gets the Wrathful Rampage special rule, kind of similar to the Wolf and Dreadnought. A chance for some genuinely scary mortal wound impact hits and more on the charge, but doesn't get quite as many as the Wolf and Dreadnought does. That one with a chance to get a big D3 plus 3. Overall, I would say that the numbers just don't really stack up too well for the Furioso, and does seem to be the single easiest Dreadnought to kill for the cost so far. With only 6 inch movement, it's not really likely to catch the things that it really wants to get in melee unless the opponent lets it. And while it does get a bit of objective control and impact hits, it's not quite as brutal as the Death Company Dreadnought with the re-roll hit rolls it gets in close combat. Overall, between all that, I do think it could go down in cost quite a bit. I've chosen to rank it a 4 out of 10 here. Could still be kind of fun as a bit of a counter charge unit that you try and keep safe, but the 6 inch movement really does hurt it even for that I think. Lastly for the Blood Angels though is the Librarian Dreadnought. Representing a fallen psyker of the chapter interred within, it is a bit curious that the Blood Angels are the only ones that seem to bother preserving their psychers in Dreadnoughts, the rest of the chapters just say no presumably. The Librarian mainly gets the same sort of profile as the standard Dreadnought, stomping around with its 8 wounds and toughness 9, and it does only move 6 inches. And for weaponry, it gets some small arms on its fist and a Blood Lance Psyche attack, potentially one really quite scary last cannon type shot, one shot at 18 inches, strength 12 and damage D6 plus 3, and a massive sustained hits D3 if you get lucky on that 6. In combat, it hits with a Furioso Fist that gets a little bit more AP than a standard Dreadnought close combat weapon at AP3, and also gets a single attack from its Force Helbers, an interesting sort of profile that's Strength 9 but damage D6 plus 3. Definitely a Dreadnought that could hit very hard if it gets one of those very punchy Psychic attacks through. Otherwise, it gets an aura of protecting your units against Psychic and Mortal Wounds, giving your units a 5 plus Feel No Pain type save against those attacks, which is actually really quite good in some matchups, maybe Tyranids with loads of zone throbes, or Thousand Sons with tons of psychic damage. The real star piece for this Dreadnought though, which makes it genuinely good, is Wings of Sanguinius, which means that once per turn in your movement phase, you get the chance to teleport one of Adeptus Astartes' infantry unit that's near to the Dreadnought, and just teleport it somewhere completely different on the map. This is some fairly godly repositioning. It means that you could potentially teleport Eradicators to melt enemy tanks right where you need them, or do this with the Gladius Fire Discipline combo, maybe with some Aggressors or perhaps some Hellblasters, or even be jumping things like Centurions around the map, or units to try and make a charge, or even just things to bounce around the table and score objectives as needed. I feel like when you get that sort of repositioning and Alpha Strike potential, it's a really big sell to have one of these. You can use that to hit the enemy hard with some infantry units exactly positioned perfectly, and then as it moves forward to actually make its damage and defense counts, You've already really had quite a lot of value out of it already. It's going to soak up some firepower with its defensive profile, and if it doesn't, it's got the potential to hit the enemy very hard with its attacks. Overall, really quite a competitive unit. It definitely crops up in competitive lists, and Gladius Task Force in particular. Overall, I've chosen to rank it a 9 out of 10. Moving on and beyond the Core Space Marine Codex, we have the Venerable Dreadnought of the Grey Knights. As every Grey Knight is, this guy is also a Psyker. It's maybe a bit disappointing that it doesn't really get any specific psychic rules this time round, not casting things like armoured resilience on itself like it used to. 
In general, the profile for it is basically the same as standard dreadnoughts from the core codex Space Marines, with the options for a single heavy weapon, missile launcher and last cannon. They'll probably go with the dreadnought combat weapon and one of those heavy weapons overall. Like the Space Wars Venerable Dreadnought, this one also gets the boosted version of Wisdom of the Ancients, allowing nearby Grey Knight infantry units to reroll hit rolls of 1 and wound rolls of 1. Again, that rule is massively superior to the Codex Space Marines one, and on average it boosts your Grey Knight's damage output by a big 35% if they can be nearby to it. It's perhaps just a little bit tricky to coordinate that with mobile Grey Knights teleporting all over the table. And while maybe you could coordinate with them and maybe have Grey Knights teleport just into range, deal damage before they might be ghosting away with Mists of Diamos again or something, it just doesn't really seem like this guy often gets running competitive Grey Knight lists at all. Vehicles in general rarely get taken all that much, and Dread Knights tend to be the pick before this guy. Overall, I've chosen to rank him a 4 out of 10, just maybe not all that exciting. It's a bit of a shame that he's quite so costly, and his damage output is quite so underwhelming for the cost. For Silver Dreadnoughts, two Golden ones, and the Custodius Dreadnoughts get the older classes. They're the last ones that can field Contempt to Dreadnoughts in 40k right now. Though it's a bit questionable whether this one in the Core Codex will survive, given that Games Workshop only have the one on sale for Horus Heresy these days. I feel like it could be possible that in the next update, they only leave the options for the unique Forge World ones, though I guess we'll wait and see. The Contempt to Dreadnoughts are a little bit chunkier than the standard Castaferum variety, they get an extra 2 wounds up to 10, and a 5 plus invulnerable save as well. They would have to be hit by something quite high AP for that to trigger and be out of cover. It's only going to kick in if you're being hit by things that are AP minus 4 or more. As with the rest of the custodies, the standard venerable contemptor gets to hit on a 2 plus, and does so with the standard combat weapons, and then either a single multi-melter or an assault cannon with a bit more strength than AP. To be honest, both the damage and defense for the cost really aren't very good at all for the massive 185 points that you pay for it, and I feel like it's only really that cost due to its unyielding ancient rule. The first time it gets destroyed, it gets to stand back up with d6 wounds remaining, so I guess most of the time it essentially comes back with a second life and a few more wounds kind of preloaded. Taking that into account, I feel like the durability gets to a place where it's okay, but its damage output is still going to be fairly outstandingly bad, even if you might occasionally get the chance to get an unusual turn where you get to deal some damage up close. Overall, not very tempting at the moment, and I'd say probably less so than the Forge World varieties. I choose to rate him a 3 out of 10 right now due to the very high points cost. Otherwise, for the Forge World Custodies Dreadnoughts, these guys look really quite epic in my opinion. Molded golden armour inlaid with the Eagles of the Custodies, and the Contempt of Achilles itself basically having an enormous Guardian Spear, sort of the mirror image of the Custodians on foot. These guys get the similar sort of profile to the standard Custodians Venerable Dreadnought, hitting on 2 plus with 10 wounds and a 5 plus invulnerable, and gets boosted damage in melee with the Lance keyword for plus 1 to wound, and damage d6 plus 1 on the Dread Spear attacks rather than flat 3, between the two being far more effective against tanks and vehicles than the Venerable Dreadnought is. He does have a bit of shooting as well, with a single damage 3 shot from the spear, plus a bunch of maybe lightly the Infernus Incinerator shots for some flamethrowers that can target some infantry. He gets another version of the Mortal Wounds on Impact hit sort of special rule as he charges into melee. Since 10th edition came out, I feel like the Custodius Dreadnoughts have maybe just lacked the raw strength that they've really needed this edition. Either just need to be a bit more dangerous or durable, or cost a few less points and they're maybe not too far from where they need to be. They tend to be kind of rare popping up in Custodes lists at the moment, which is maybe kind of telling seeing as Custodes in general aren't doing so great in game now. Overall I've chosen to rank this guy 5 out of 10 for that reason. Maybe not too enormously far from where it needs to be, but just not really taken competitively currently. Otherwise its counterpart is the Contempt of Galatus Dreadnought. This one's the one with the Dreadnought style shield and warblade. The shield gives it a 4 plus invulnerable, which is a bit more meaningful than the 5 plus that the other things get, and a minus 1 to wound in combat definitely makes it a lot more sturdy there, though it does perhaps trade a bit of damage output against heavy hitters for that, getting 8 attacks at strength 8 and damage 3, so wounding a lot of tanks and vehicles and things on a 5 plus. Overall in a probably kind of similar sort of place to the Achilles, given its 175 point price tag, more tempting if you want to Dreadnought a bit more sturdy, and still does great work against medium infantry in fighting, just maybe not quite as general purpose, and still not really stand out durable. Finally for the Custodes, we have the Telamon Heavy Dreadnought, perhaps one of the coolest looking Dreadnoughts of Warhammer 40k. 
and also in lore perhaps the most high-tech and high-spec dreadnought out of any of them, artisan-crafted heavy weaponry of the Custodes, and a massively armoured sarcophagus, supposedly each one bearing one plate that was hand-wrought by the Emperor himself during the Great Crusades. As a result, there aren't many of these things around. Profile-wise, it's kind of similar to the Redemptor chassis, with toughness 10 and 12 wounds, but it gets a big 4 plus and vulnerable save built in, and it gets the same special rule as the Redemptor Dreadnought with minus 1 damage, so it's a lot more resilient against damage 2 and damage 3 compared with lots of other Dreadnoughts out there. I'd say its ranged weapons really are a bit of a letdown though, the Iliastus Accelerator Culverin is basically a pair of auto cannons, and the Arachna Storm Cannon pretty much a pair of assault cannons, not really the worst, but maybe not massively exciting. And then pretty standard issue, Dreadnought fighting in close combat at strength 12 and damage 3. Not awful, but not really that great for 235 points. Overall pretty tanky and will chew away at the enemy, but perhaps surprisingly disappointing damage output from a Dreadnought that looks this big and this cool. Perhaps a little bit underwhelming as a big gun for the Custodius versus the intensely dangerous Caladius tanks. Overall, as a result, I rate this guy a 4 out of 10 in game right now. Can certainly still absorb a lot of firepower and be good against the right sort of targets, but doesn't really threaten the enemy heavies all that much. Moving on to the Chaos Hell Brutes now, and these are essentially the twisted mirror of the standard Space Marine Dreadnoughts. Though for the majority of servants of the Heretic Astartes, it's not seen as any great honour or duty to continue to serve their legion from within the confines of an iron sarcophagus but rather a living punishment and a nightmarish fate, most seeking death or driven to madness as a result. The standard Hellbrutes from Codex Chaos Space Marines get similar sort of options to the Loyalists, though a few are a little changed. A similar kind of array of the standard heavy weapons available, though a little bit more choice on the close combat side of things, with options like the Hellbrute Hammer and Power Scourge if you want to tailor a bit more to vehicles or clearing out hordes of troops. I'd probably go for either the fist or hammer myself though, if you're not just using it in supporting gun turret mode. The Chaos Hellbrutes mostly have things that help out other things in the army or one way or the other, and arguably the Chaos Space Marine Hellbrute might be one of the most powerful, allowing Heretic Astartes to get both effects of a dark pact rather than just one when they make their attacks, so potentially both sustained and lethal hits when they make an attack. And if you have one of the appropriate god-specific marks for, say, one of the range damage dealers like Nurgle, you would get both of those going off on a 5+, plus, which is kind of big. If it's got enough scary firepower or ground-bound units to buff, then that could be enough to justify its inclusion, though like the standard loyalist dreadnought would say that its own damage and defence aren't really anything to write home about, it is mainly selling itself more of a supporting piece than the main event. Despite really quite a powerful boost that can affect some scary stuff like Forge Fiends or various types of elite infantry, they still tend to be kind of rarely used due to their own damage and defence, I feel like if you wanted to build around one of them, it's really not the worst idea in the world. I've chosen to rank this one a 7.5 out of 10. For the god-specific Chaos Legions, they all get slight variations on the same sort of theme, similar kind of war gear, though there are a few variants here and there, like the Death Guard one getting play combi bolters and heavy bolters, so getting some lethal hits on those choices if you take them. The Death Guard Hellbrute's primary special rule is to hand out Contagions of Nurgle to one unit that you've shot, potentially meaning that you could debuff the enemy for minus 1 AP as well as minus 1 toughness at long range. Quite nice if maybe you're opening fire with a whole bunch of Plague Burst Crawlers or other Death Guard armour of some sort and you can't get them within Contagion range naturally. Otherwise it also gets an Enraged Impact special rule where you get some mortal wounds on the charge. And again, like the standard Chaos Space Marine one, you probably wouldn't want to take more than one of them to hand out that special rule, as its damage and defence just aren't really very good overall for 140 points. Again, kind of rare to see them in absolutely honed top competitive Death Guard list. I feel like perhaps one of them to hand out the combined Contagion debuff though maybe isn't the worst though. I've chosen to rank them a 7 out of 10 overall, going with Nurgle's holy number. For the Thousand Suns one though, I wouldn't be quite as optimistic. This one gets a 5 plus invulnerable save due to its sorcerous nature I guess, and like the Nurgle one it gets some fancy bolt weapons, getting an extra AP on its Inferno heavy bolter or Inferno combi bolter options. Its invulnerable save isn't going to be relevant against most things though, just the very most high AP shooting like certain melter weapons, and I'd argue that its buffing rule just really isn't very good at all. If you use Kabbalistic rituals within 9 inches of it then you gain a Cabal point, which realistically, even if you're using lots of Kabbalistic rituals around it, you may be adding up to perhaps two or three overall. 
which perhaps is only going to be slightly more than taking his equivalent weight in points of Rubit Marines or Sorcerers. Unlike the Death Guard and the Chaos Space Marine one, it just doesn't really feel like he's adding anything interesting to the army by helping out other meaningful units and not really worth putting up with his low damage output and defence for, really. I've chosen to rank him a 3 out of 10 overall. It probably also doesn't really make sense to be wanting to cluster up all your Kabbalistic rituals either. Next up for the Blood God, we've got the World Eater's Hellbrute, 140 points for a similar sort of stat line. And he will be hitting a bit harder than a few of the rest of them in melee as well, getting extra attacks on the charge. His special rule is that when he gets attacked, he either gets to shoot as if it were the shooting phase, or fight as if it were the fight phase. I feel like this is actually a kind of interesting special rule. The other units that have it, like the Death Company Dreadnought and the Wolf and Dreadnought, don't really have any meaningful shooting. This guy at least gets one big gun. Could at least make your opponent think twice if that you're going to get pinged back by a big last cannon shot or something. Each time he tries to attack you in the shooting phase, still wouldn't necessarily help you loads if you just get wiped out by one enormous shooting shot from a dedicated anti-tank unit. Though if your opponent makes the mistake of sending any sort of chip damage at it, then you might deal more damage in the strike back. Still probably a bit niche overall between taking points away from things like Savage 8 Bound, and you might be more tempted by things like Wardog Brigands if you want shooty gun walkers for World Eaters perhaps. But at least his draw is kind of interesting. I've chosen to give him a 5 out of 10 ranking overall. Moving on, finally we get to the Xenos Dreadnoughts, so Orcs and Eldar here. For the Orcs, first up we have the trusty Death Dread, who perhaps with a bit of green skin short-sightedness represents an Orc that rather than being injured in the line of duty has just volunteered for being wired into a great big metal shell. Perhaps thinking that having a great big clanking piston and sword wielding body is going to be a shortcut to power. Unfortunately, being permanently wired inside a metal can doesn't really do them the most good for this, and it can make the unlucky orky pilots go a bit mad. In game, the Orc Death Dreads got a similar sort of profile to the standard Loyalist Space Marine Dreadnought. Toughness 9, 8 wounds, and a shiny new 2 plus armor save for 10th edition, and gets a 6 plus invulnerable save that's to represent Orc Ramshackle Construction. That one is very unlikely to trigger though, as you need to get up to AP minus 5 there. It does at least move fairly quickly towards combat with a big 8 inch move, so maybe a little bit faster than some of the others on this list. For weapons, the Dread Claws are the most reliable thing, getting a base 4 attacks at strength 10 and damage 3. Though you get more for each other arm that you bolt on, so you could have up to 7 for the standard Dread Arms, or you could swap out individual attacks for a bit of ranged shooting, maybe Scorchers for a bit of Overwatch if you wanted, or Rockets or Custom Mega Blasters to have a bit more threat against medium infantry at range. Its special rules may be a little bit lackluster, making enemies take battle shock tests. Could occasionally be handy enough, though, in a protracted combat and allowing you to score objectives in your own turn. Overall, I feel like it's not awful, and its melee does get a bit better with both the War tribe and the turn that you call the War. Should hit fairly solidly on the charge, at least. At the moment, though, I feel like basically all the Orky Walkers are just a bit overcosted compared with other things like other fighting infantry jumping out of trucks. Generally seen as not the ones to go for, for melee purposes, compared with faster stuff. Overall, I rate this guy a 4 out of 10 currently. I feel like he'd get considerably more useful if he either went down a few points or got a bit more dangerous. In a similar vein, the killer cans are basically the exact same thing, but done to a Gretchen rather than an orc. It's maybe a bit of a brave move to give a vengeful Gretchen access to massive heavy weapons and big claws. They can certainly choose to take a bit of revenge on their former orky bullies. Gretchen tend to be a bit happier about the exchange to get a bit more power and standing within Orky society and not have quite as much of a perilous existence as they had before, though they still keep the Gretchen's cowardly nature. And sometimes killer cans are noted to just flee off the battlefield at the first sign of gunfire. Gretchen instincts are hard to overcome. The killer cans are perhaps the smallest thing that I thought really counted as a dreadnought. Five wounds at toughness six with a three plus save. For 50 points each, I guess you get a fair amount of wounds on the table for that cost though they are quite easy to kill with things like plasma and melter weapons. You get one big gun that hits on a 4+, plus with the additional option of the Grotzuka, though I feel like maybe the rocket launcher is the most exciting with D3 shots at strength 9 and damage 3. A trio of those with blast is at least fairly threatening to medium infantry. Then in combat they get a flurry of strength 8 and damage 3 attacks, again quite threatening against medium infantry, and could punch up a little bit against vehicles. A special rule is kind of fun, giving you a small chance to deal a bit of damage against nearby orc things as they go on their shooty power trip, but otherwise they get to ignore cover, which is pretty handy with AP2 rockets and things. Again, I feel like these guys maybe aren't too bad for just getting some raw wounds on the table, 
and ones that are quite likely to do damage against most things in Warhammer 40k. Maybe again just seeming a touch over costed for what they really bring to the table though. I'd rate them a 4 out of 10 overall. Finally for the Orcs they get a couple of big and stompy bigger Dreadnoughts. The Mega Dreadnought is basically like a Death Dread but bigger. Really quite a hefty beast at 16 wounds, a 2 plus save and toughness 10. I think its durability is okay for the cost. It is kind of wildly inaccurate as ever as Orcs are with its kill cannon though which does get a few shots but going off at Ballistic Skill 5 plus. And for 225 points I'd say its melee is merely okay at either 6 attacks at strength 12 or 4 attacks at strength 14 damage 4. It gets some mortal wound impact hits as well, but in general I don't really feel like this thing does anything enormously well besides be at least somewhat tough. I've chosen to rank this a 2 out of 10. Seems like the smaller orky walkers are considerably better value than this guy right now. Out of the two Forge World orky things though, the Mecha Dread might be the one to go for. I believe the idea for this one is that it's a Dreadnought that a mech boy has built for himself. It's a little bit cheaper than the Mega Dread and gets perhaps a better special rule. Healing a nearby vehicle and giving it plus one to hit, which I believe can be the Mecha Dread itself as well. So basically it'd have a kill cannon that hits considerably better and it'd be more dangerous in melee as well. Definitely seems by far the superior one out of the two, but still probably not pushing it to any exciting levels in terms of general orky power though. Finally for our big dreadnought journey we have the Eldar dreadnoughts, or Wraith Lords as they refer to them. Ghost warriors piloted by a fallen noble, spirit stones interred within its shell, and animated by its warrior spirit striding forward to defend the craft world and the living from the enemies of the race. They're made out of toughened wraith bone, making them spectacularly durable, which seems to have translated into in-game rules well here, with toughness 11, 10 wounds and their 2 plus armor save. Overall for Eldar, they're fairly tough for the cost as it goes. They can pack a pair of bright lances for some solid anti-tank firepower with those massive battle host rerolls. At least compared with a lot of other dreadnoughts on the list, given those innate buffs, that's some pretty enormous shooting power. And can back that up in close combat with a ghost glaive with sweep or strike profiles. He gets a special rule called Fated Hero, allowing you to get a d6 and add it to your fate dice pool each time you slay an enemy unit. Maybe a bit unreliable, as I feel like even if he's slaying one enemy unit throughout the course of the game, then he's probably done his job. But I guess not too bad to have as a side bonus, I suppose. Maybe a kind of interesting one to rate. I don't really very regularly see play in competitive Eldari lists at the moment, but they are seeing competition from all sorts of very, very strong stuff. And they might break through a bit more if Eldari do indeed receive some nerfs that they're expecting in January. Overall, I've chosen to rank him a 7 out of 10 here. I'd say playable, but probably not optimal for the faction right now. Finally, for the Eldari, I've chosen not really to count the Wraith Guard as they feel more like infantry, and the Wraith Knight is a bit of a half half with a pilot as well as an interred soul. But there is also the Forge World Wraith Seer, basically the equivalent of a Wraith Lord, but having a Far Seer within it, still able to read the runes somewhat and unnaturally guide his constructs to destroy the enemy. The profile is pretty much the same as the standard Wraith Lord, he gets a 5 plus and vulnerable save in addition, I guess to represent his unnatural protection and knowledge of what's to come, and gets to attack with a shoulder mounted heavy weapon that includes an option for a different D cannon, though it's only a single shot that gets devastating wounds, it doesn't have the ignores line of sight special rule anymore. Otherwise he also gets Destructor as a small psychic attack, and his Ghost Spear is a slight variant on the Wraith Lord's Ghost Glaive, Picking up anti-infantry and precision, but losing a bit of AP and damage. Finally, his special rule I'd say is maybe a little bit less useful, allowing you to generate a battle shock test against one unit that he shoots. Maybe not the worst in the world to prevent some stratagems, but not generally as handy as the chance to farm fate dice in normal circumstances. Overall, between that, I'd see him as probably the second choice to the standard Wraith Lord at the moment, just due to the raw threat and damage that the standard one can bring. Within context of the Eldari Codex, I'd probably rate him as a 4 out of 10. Just not really quite as dangerous for the cost, and compares a bit badly against the standard one, I think. In any case, I guess we'll leave that there for our look through the 40k Dreadnoughts. Overall, really quite a lot of cool stuff out there. I feel like quite a lot of these maybe do need a bit of help rules-wise, though. For some, they do seem to be front and centre within their factions, like the Space Marine ones, but others, they really do seem to fade into the background a bit, maybe being seen as a bit more generic picks by Games Workshop, perhaps. For best Dreadnoughts in 40k at the moment, I'd probably rate the ones that are put 9 out of 10 here. The Redemptor and Ballistas for standard Space Marines do great work. Bjorn the Foul-Handed is awesome for the Space Wolves. 
and the librarian dreadnought for the Blood Angels with its teleport shenanigans is pretty top tier, and the rest of them really ranging from interesting and usable all the way down to just underpowered. Let me know your thoughts on these big deathless war machines though. Which ones are your favourites and why? Let me know down in the comments. If you've enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics, while I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Auspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep these videos coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.